Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually going to talk more about trust in numbers than, than risk. Um, I'm a statistician. I'm in the maths department in Cambridge. You may wonder what on earth I'm doing here. Um, and, uh, but I'm really interested in how we could apply the sort of ideas that we've heard about so far today to communicating numbers and quantitative evidence. Numbers are important. And we've heard from Honora Neal the criteria we might use to assess the trustworthiness of, of information we receive. And the first one she requires is competence. So let's apply that perhaps to Fox News and their competence at producing a pie chart there. And um, <laughs> yet, as, a bit, so come on, a bit faster. My year eights can get it quicker than that. Come on. So she also said, you know, what about honesty? Well, let's try that to Fox News. What about honesty? So what about that as an honest graph to communicate a difference between 6 million and 7 million? Now, it's such a cheap trick, cutting the axis. We all see, we've seen that all the time. And Fox News said, oh, no, they, they pretended it was competence. They said, oh, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. And they, and they produced a new one. Yeah. But now we come to the third aspect that Honora points out, which is reliability. And Fox News are enormously reliable. They always produce graphs like that. <laughs> it's not a mistake. They do it deliberately. So they are reliable. You can reliably assure yourself that it's going to be manipulative. And we, th what, it, what I'm going to move on to now is the fact that these general criteria that Honora pointed out are incredibly valuable. But numbers are also a bit special. They're a bit special because they are magnitudes. I, I love numbers, but, but you know, people think of numbers as if they're you know, a bit like teenage boys, as if they've, they've got a tough and confident exterior. But actually, inside, numbers are soft, delicate, sensitive things. They're easily abused. We must look after them carefully. So I think number abuse actually should be a criminal offense in this country. And, um, and of course, there is a classic example, which I don't need to point, to point out what people have done there. So this number does exist in the national accounts. It's been picked out, but it's been highly selected and presented in a certain way. And what I'm going to point out now is a particular aspect about trust in numbers. And the fact that numbers are magnitudes. They measure how big things are. But when they are communicated, they are communicated to make themselves look large or small, almost every time, whether you're, whether you're Brexit or whether you're Remain. The number is communicated in such a way it's framed, as all psychologists know, about the importance of framing to make it look large and small to reinforce your argument. In other words, numbers are used to coerce and manipulate rather than inform, as just again as Anur Anil pointed out in her talk earlier today. So what can we do about that? You know, I, it really upsets me. You know, what can we do about it? Why are numbers always, ah, yes, a little challenge for you, 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 you. Qu go into the depths of your soul and admit the last time you used a number in a meeting or an argument, was it to make it look big or small? Was it as a part of an argument to try to persuade someone that someone of something? You brought out a number, a statistic that clinched it. And I bet you've all done it. I know I have. So, this happens all the time. What can we do about it? Well, we have got some examples of how we might go about improving that situation. And that is in the area of personal health care. Now, some of you may know about the Montgomery judgment that's revolutionizing now, legally, the way in which uh, surgeons need to get consent for operations. It all used to be based on the, what was known as the Bolam judgment, that um, doctors had to explain things to the extent that their, their peers, the, the doctors, thought were reasonable um, uh, communication, re reasonable things to tell the patient about. That has now changed under the Montgomery judgment that now holds in this country. Patients must be ta ta told about risks that could be important to them, that a reasonable doctor was, would think was important to them. And so patients must understand the options according to their own values and feelings. Now, all this is doing is, is saying that doctors should do what good doctors have done all the time, which is to ask for a patient, what is important to you? What, what is important to you? Not just tell people facts. Ask what is important to you to help people to balance those options. So the, the, what, what's supposed to happen now is that when you are presented with an options of a surgery, um, you will be presented with the options and the possible risks and benefits of each of those presented in a balanced way to allow you to, provide, to, um, uh, to um, apply your own values and feelings to decide what's, what you want. 
Can I ask you a little question? Um, now, who, okay, first of all, um, uh, who, when you, well, let's pretend you're going into a doctor, if you're facing some surgery, would you like to have the options explained to you? Yes, okay. All right, now, and try to be, I mean, this is a bit simplified, but okay, so the doctor's done that, explained all the options. You've got two choices now, broadly speaking. You can say, thank you very much for telling me, what do you think I should do? Or you can say, thank you very much for telling me, now shut up, I'm going home to talk to my family about it. Who would tend to be in the first camp, wanting to get a strong steer as to what you might do? And who would tend to be in the second camp, saying, uh, that's enough, thank you, I'm going to make, or not, or not quite make up my own mind, I'm going to reflect on this with my family? Yeah, a minority. Notice that? It's usually, about, it's usually the majority want a very strong steer. And I'd say that's completely reasonable. So uh, my belief is that everyone has got a right to receive balanced information. And everyone has also got the right to say, thank you very much, now what do you think I should do? To reflect it back. Now that is now being you know, legally obliged uh, that surgeons must do that. Why can't we do that as citizens too? Why, when we're present, being presented with evidence and data about alternative policies that the government faces, whether it's regulation for e-cigarettes or whatever, whatever, or even Brexit, why can't we be told, and this is very idealistic, what the options are, what the benefits and harms of those alternative options are? We can, we can then say, thank you very much for telling me, you decide, or we can say, thank you very much for telling me, I, this is what I want to do. That's up to us, how we reflect it. So I, th I think this is a really powerful idea, it's, it, and it's this idea of, of um, you know, no trust and expert and post-truth society, I just think is, is inappropriate. All the evidence suggests that people do want access to evidence, and they want to feel that policies are being made on the basis of good evidence. And uh, so I think these are basic principles. I'd like to just mention very briefly about crises, because people ask me about risk and things like that. Crises are a bit different, because we haven't got time to maybe consider all the evidence and make up our minds in a nice, balanced way when, you know, real panic is happening. So John Krebs, who is head of the Food Standards Agency, developed a procedure for dealing with the numerous crises he was f faced with. He had BSE, he had everything. What a shambles he, when he was, uh, you know, in terms of food. And he dealt with everything using this a fixed structure, which I think is very powerful, to first of all communicate what we know, what we're confident about, to, to, really, to you know, really push that we, that we have a consensus, what we actually know, but then immediately to say what we don't know. The humility that's been called for earlier on today, that the scientists must admit humility. They've got to say what they don't know. They've got to have the courage to admit that, to don't say, oh, don't you worry your little heads about it. You know, we'll just trust us, like the nuclear industry has. But then you can have confidence about what we're going to do. You know, we are, this is what we're going to do um, you know, to, um, as the next stage. And the crucial thing is then to give people self-efficacy, what they can do. You can stop eating lamb if you want. This is due to the, scra in the scrapey crisis, I think. We didn't know whether it had gone into lamb or not. You can stop eating lamb. Actually, people did stop eating lamb, then the price went down, and then they started eating it again. <laughs> to emphasize that things change, that everything depends on our current state of knowledge, that things might change, that we might adapt when we find out more, and we will come back to you and update you. And this, this strategy worked very well, and also the fact that this was not government ministers doing these, doing these um, announcements, because when we get to government ministers doing it, we're left to the situation in 1990 that many of you will remember, with John Gummer force-feeding his daughter Cordelia, his four-year-old daughter, a British beef burger. And there, there they are enjoying their beef burger. But unfortunately, of course, we realize this was perhaps not a great time you know, possibly to be eating British beef. And, uh, of course, the other thing on trust and why trust to, uh, why we must be in constant scrutiny in order to assess trustworthiness is really revealed by a close examination of this photograph where forensic analysis reveals that that is not the bite mark of a four-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.